Völker der Welt, schaut auf diese Stadt, nicht preisgeben dürft, nicht preisgeben könnt. The long-awaited surrender of Nazi Germany spurred a sense of peace and joy that was long deprived of in the Allied States. Amidst the festive mood, much of Germany was still left in despair as the population struggled to resuscitate from the political, economical, cultural, and social backlash of the war. In the absence of a government, a power vacuum also emerged amongst the victors. Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and Franklin D. Roosevelt had already met for a seven-day conference in Crimea, Russia, to discuss the post-war world agreeing to split Germany into four occupation zones. Dubbed the Alta Conference, it would only be the beginning of a rising conflict amongst the victors. Meeting again in a conference full of open disagreements in Potsdam, the leaders of the three nations all sensed a rising tension between the ideals of communism in the Soviet Union and capitalism in the United States. It was a turbulent relationship bound to be broken at its inception. The Soviets had suffered heavily from attacks launched by Germany during both world wars and had hoped to eliminate any chance of that happening again. After the Second World War, the Soviets rapidly expanded its control in Eastern Europe and used Germany as a communist puppet state as a means to keep the Western powers from interfering. On the other hand, the United States hoped to develop Germany into a valuable trading partner and utilize the country as an obstacle for the Soviet Union's expanding communist influence. Germany served as a nominal battlefield for the escalating Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. In piercing deep inside the heart of the Soviet occupation zone lay the city of Berlin and its French, British, and American sectors. The Reichsmark, which was introduced after the 1920s German inflation, continued to circulate in Germany despite having little to no value. Cigarettes functioned in their place as a de facto currency over bartering. Standing by their policy of debilitating Germany, the Soviets sabotaged efforts to revive the Reichsmark by excessively printing in the billions. The USA, Britain, and France had already merged their zones at this point and announced on June 1, 1948 that they would create a provisional government to govern West Germany. Against the wishes of the Soviet Union, the United States had also proposed to the ACC the creation of the Deutschmark along with a Marshall Plan to back it. In allocating over $13 billion in economic existence to Europe, the United States made clear its intention to revitalize Germany. Anticipating a currency reform, the Soviets also introduced their own currency, the East German Mark, to be circulated in East Berlin and Germany. Under realization that a divided Germany was not in the best interests of, of the Soviets, Stalin proceeded to apply pressure to the West's most vulnerable location, Berlin. On the 24th of June, the Soviets severed all water and land connections between the Allied zones and West Berlin. Berlin was located deep inside the Soviet zone and had required heavily on outside sources to suit their needs. They would proceed to stop supplying food to West Berlin, and the power station, which was located in East Berlin, cut off the electricity. Surrounded by Soviet troops, Berlin was stranded with 36 days worth of food and 45 days worth of coal remaining. Allied troops were vastly outnumbered and could barely put up a fight against a Soviet attack. If President Truman ordered a retreat of troops, it was signal that democracy was vulnerable to Soviet aggression, exactly what the Soviets had aimed for. General Curtis LeMay, commander of the United States Air Force in Europe, suggested that an armed convoy to be set, blazing a path through East Germany. Washington vetoed the plan. There was, however, a third compromise. It had been agreed upon that there would be three 20-mile-wide air corridors providing free access to Berlin. A few months prior in April, the Soviets had also halted traffic, but Truman continued to supply West Berlin by air. An airlift would put the Soviets at a position where they would either shoot the planes down, which would be breaking the agreement, or back down. Learning that the British was already running an airlift in support of the British sector, General Lucius Clay consulted General Sir Brian Robertson for some numbers regarding rationing, concluding from a minimum daily ration of 1,990 calories, 1,534 tons of food, and 3,475 tons of coal, diesel, and petroleum was needed, and so the bar was set by the American government. 
However, post-war demobilization had only left two groups of US C-47 Skytrain transports in Europe, amassing a total of 96 aircraft. Even if the planes were to make 100 round trips per day, the 3.5 ton limit only transport about 300 tons per day, far from the 5,000 ton target. To increase capacity, the Americans ordered Douglas C-54 transports from as far away as Guam and Alaska. The British and French also crucially supported the cause. And on the 26th of June, the Berlin Airlift, codenamed Operation Vittles, hauled the first 80 tons of cargo. The airlift expected to last a mere three weeks. One weekend, the airlift was still crawling, averaging a mere 90 pounds per day. Ridiculed by the Soviet press, it was evident that the airlift needed better coordination. Following the influx of planes, accommodations were made in an attempt to increase efficiency. Airlifts would be scheduled to take off every four minutes, with five planes stacking 1,000 meters above each other. With this adjustment, the airlift was on its feet, by the second week reaching 1,000 tons per day. The operation was also still in many aspects loosely organized. Crews were ineffectively used, maintenance inadequate, and record keeping barely sufficient. When it became clear that the airlift would have to be a long-term solution to Berlin, General William H. Tunner was appointed to take over the operation. Following his arrival, General Tunner made immediate changes to the entirety of the airlift. He banned aircrew from leaving the aircraft, equipping jeeps as snack bars for refreshment. Berliners were also employed to assist with maintenance, and the time for unloading plummeted drastically. By the end of August, the airlift was transporting more than 4,500 tons of cargo per day. Gail Halverson, one of the airlift pilots, had been making unauthorized drops of objects right before his landing to kids waiting below. Upon realizing that Halverson had been dropping candy bars, General Tunner sensed the potential value behind the act and ordered that the candy drops expanded. Despite the success of the airlift, there were also a fair share of problems. Most notably on August 13th, when a C-54 transport crashed into a runway, hindering and causing issues to subsequent landings. Despite this, the airlift had been an overall success throughout the summer as adequate supplies flew into Berlin. But with the passing of autumn, a new challenge loomed. Stalin was stalling diplomatically as the winter would pose a new set of challenges to the Allies. The change to winter demanded a larger quantity of coal to be delivered into Berlin every day, and requirements increased by nearly a thousand tons. Furthermore, the methods workers had used to maintain the worn-out runways would be inapplicable. These challenges were quickly addressed with the increment in planes accommodated by former Luftwaffe ground crews, as well as new and improved runways. But no matter what reparation was to be made, the obstacle of winter still remained at large. Throughout the winter, planes often landed at zero visibility in a season blanketed by one of the longest lasting fogs Berlin has ever witnessed. Planes flew whenever there was a slight chance of getting through, but far too often they would be unable to make a landing. Soviet fighters applied even more pressure by constantly buzzing and harassing the unarmed cargo planes. November and December were the worst months of the airlift by far. On the 20th of November, 42 planes departed for Berlin, but only one was able to land. But with the turning of the year and the passing of seasons, the airlift pulled through, and on the 21st of April, the tonnage of supplies airlifted exceeded the tonnage previously brought in through rail. The Soviets, realizing that the Allies were not willing to give up Berlin, suffered a moral defeat, and the four powers began negotiations. On the 12th of May, 1949, the Soviet blockade of Berlin was finally lifted. It was a short-lived compromise, for tensions broke out again, some in the form of a space race, war in Korea, and missile crisis. But a short compromise is better than an everlasting conflict. <laughs>